27 with me this morning. Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27. And verse number 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Verse 26, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Father, bless your holy word, Lord. And for the few minutes this morning that I have this privilege to stand and declare your word, Lord, and speak for you. I pray for the unction of the Holy Spirit, and I pray for wisdom and for the message for this hour. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In verse number 22, Pilate, a secular ruler, a Roman governor, they call him the procurator. He had nothing in this. He was not a Jew, didn't believe in the Jewish Messiah, had no use for the religion, either one way or the other. He said to them in verse 23, What evil hath he done? He had examined the man, found nothing, nothing, nothing in him worthy of death. Yet in the hands of religious fanatics, you cannot reason with them. There's no reasoning. Blinded by their own hatred for Christ, they wanted him crucified. Crucifixion is undoubtedly one of the most horrendous things that has been devised by the, man, by the hand of a human being. I marvel at the few years that I've been on this earth at how human beings can torture other human beings and what they can do to each other. There's plenty of hell on earth to go around. If you don't know that, you haven't lived long. But after you've lived a while, you'll realize that this world's full of suffering, full of sorrow, full of tears, full of pain. It's everywhere you look. But there's an awful lot of suffering and sorrow and pain and tears and woe that's brought upon mankind by mankind. Man's the author of it. Of course, ultimately, I know this morning where it came from. It came from the one who's the liar from the beginning. The devil, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, that great red dragon, Leviathan. You know who I'm talking about? The devil. The God of this world, for some perverted reason, I'm sure he takes delight in watching humanity suffer. Could be because he's headed for suffering and damnation himself. But whatever the reason, we do know that here in the book of Matthew chapter number 27, the Lord Jesus Christ is delivered up to be crucified. You've been spared that in your lifetime. The, uh, the, uh, the federal government, the United States of America, doesn't crucify anyone. If it did, why... I suppose there'd be an uprising. Whatever executions now in this nation are taking place, that take place in closed chambers with only a hand-picked hand few that view it, usually by lethal injection, and uh, some families of the victims and what have you are there to see it. But that's it. <clears throat> it's not a public spectacle, although personally I believe it should be. Amen. So what do you base that on, preacher of the Bible? Yeah. The Lord Jesus, the, in the Old Testament, God said, when you execute one, you do it publicly so that they may understand what it's about, what it's for, may see it and may fear. I realize in the hands of government that you're not, it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, administered fairly. But anyway, we're talking about crucifixion this morning, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is an undeniable fact that the Son of God was crucified. Josephus, the first century historian, made it very clear. Not only did he, but some of the, some of the uh, uh, secular uh, writers, they talked about this man, Christ Jesus, this Jew that had, was the founder of a new religion. And we know from secular sources and we know from the Bible 
that he was crucified. Crucifixion's a horrible thing. It's one of the most horrendous methods that man's ever chosen to torture and kill. A lot of people are put to death with no torture involved, but crucifixion involves torture. The, the individual, it's designed to make them suffer. Suffer as long as possible before death eventually comes. Sometimes they would hang for days on a cross and they would open, be subject to the elements, subject to animals, subject to the birds and all of that, and they would suffer. And God in His wisdom, in eternity past, for some reason, God only knows, chose the method of crucifixion for the death of His Son. He could have died other ways, but it was crucifixion because of the fact that He would be public and He would be nailed and He would be uplifted. He would be suspended between heaven and earth. And he would be nailed upon a cross, and that cross, therefore, would stand throughout eternity as the place of God's love for mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, when he was born, he was born to die. The shadow of the cross followed him everywhere he went. He knew where he, he, knew where he was headed, and he knew why he was going there. He was not a victim of circumstances. He was not a martyr. His death was the death that was predetermined before the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God, the Bible said, who was offered before the foundation of the world. There's a message in the book of, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter number 27. But in Acts chapter number 2, I want you to notice something here as it is related to this crucifixion. In Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 23, there's a message here. In Acts 2 verse 23, And him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. When the apostle Peter preached in Acts 2, he made it very clear that the Jew had blood on his hands. That he was held accountable for the crucifixion of Christ. Look at verse number 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. In verse number 30, verse, chapter number 4 and verse number 10, we read these words. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now, my friend, I'm not telling you today that the Jew is completely responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, but I am telling you that they are culpable, that they are accountable, and that the day will come when God will require his blood at their hands, and they will have to come before him and give an account for the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else about the cross, though. In John chapter number 10, I want you to look at the man. In John chapter number 10 and verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, as I said a moment ago, is not the victim of circumstances. He freely laid his life down so that you could be saved. The crucifixion of Christ took place 2,000 years ago. You may never have read about it. You may never have known about it until the Holy Spirit made it real to your life. But once it is made real to you, and once you understand what happened that day 2,000 years ago, then you become accountable for the crucifixion and for the death of Christ. Why did he die? You have to ask yourself that question. It begs an answer. Why did he die? Why did they take this man outside Jerusalem to the northern side and there nail him on a cross? The one who healed the leper, raised the dead, walked on water, cast out devils, and healed the sick. The one who never did a thing for himself all of his life, but he did it for someone else. The one who manifested compassion and love upon this earth like it has never known before. We have a long history among mankind of despots, of my people, those who would kill and maim and destroy and take life from others. You see it every day and it gets worse by the day. And the reason it does is because humanity is overshadowed with a pale, with a, with a canopy of demonism and evil spirit that is affecting the mankind and his life today. So why would they want to take a man like this? A man who is perfect and sinless. A man who loved people like he loved them and they'd never been loved before. He loved the unlovable. He loved the leper. He loved the killer. He loved the murderer. He loved the rapist. He loved them all. He loved them with an unconditional love. 
Why would they take a man like that and take him out and nail him to a cross? In the book of Psalm chapter number 22 and verse number 12, this gives you a little picture of the battle that took place while he was hanging upon the tree. In Psalm chapter number 22 and verse 12, we read these words. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. There is no way that you can deny that the 22nd Psalm is a direct reference to crucifixion. Yeah. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse number 16. This is a reference to the crucified Christ. But he says something about dogs. And he says something about bulls. In the book of Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 15. We read these words. Colossians 2.15 and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This is the battle that raged upon the cross. This was not obvious to the mind. It was not obvious to sight. Because the battle was a spiritual battle that was taking place. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the enemy's territory. He went behind the lines. He, has to, he came to the very strength of Satan. And there in the weakness of his flesh, he approached him. At the cross at Calvary was the consummation, the culmination of a sinless perfect life. Because it was there that the battle lines were drawn. And the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross was coming against one spiritual power against another. In Colossians chapter number 2, the Bible said he spoiled them. That word spoil literally means that he ripped off their covering. It means that he made a show of them what they really were openly. It was there that, in, that, it was there that hatred was opened up. It was there that guile was opened up. But it was there that injustice was opened up. It is there that all the wickedness of Satan and what drives this world was made public for all the world to see. Any man that had a soul at all, when he looked up at the cross, he'd have to say to himself, what's going on here? Why is an innocent man dying on a tree? What's wrong with you people? Why is he being crucified? It was there that Satan threw at Christ every Everything he had it was there that he tried to destroy him it was there that finally Satan began to realize that this man that he had met a few years before out there in the wilderness and for 40 days he tempted him and tried to get him to sin and it was there that he said if you be the son of God turn these stones into bread it was there that he confronted Christ but it wasn't until my friend later on that Satan began to realize that the one that he was coming against was one far greater than he was he was the incarnate God all Almighty. Not only could Satan see his flesh, but Satan being a spirit being was coming now face to face with a spirit of Almighty God incarnate in a human being and a man. And my friend, I don't know if Satan was ready, but it was at the cross that God stripped him of his power. It was there that he destroyed the works of Satan. It was there that he came eyeball to eyeball against the one who was the instrument of death and damnation on this earth. There had to be a battle. There had to be a confrontation. There had to be a time when God came against Satan face to face. And it was at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He stripped off his lies. He stripped off his, de his deception. He stripped off all that Satan uses when he condemns men to damnation and hell fire and made a show of him openly. He opened him up for the whole world to see. You want to follow one that does that? Do you want to follow one who's a liar and a murderer from the beginning? You want to give your life to one who will laugh one day when you go to hell and burn? Do you want to live for one who's been nothing but death and damnation ever since he came into the world? Then you can worship Satan. And that's exactly what people are doing today. Or what about the one who went to the cross, innocent and perfect and guileless and guiltless? The one who went there because he loved you. The one who took upon himself your sin. The one who bore your damnation damnation and condemnation what about him what about loving one like that who gave himself so that you could be saved so there's a battle that rages and that battle rages much deeper than I could ever give you much greater than I could ever say a foretaste of that battle is where it says in Hebrews 5 
in the days of his flesh with strong cries and tearing, strong tears and crying. He was heard in that he feared and he was able to deliver him from death. My friend, the death that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed to God to deliver him from was not the cross. It was the condemnation of a holy God against the one that he had made sin so that we could be saved and brought him up out of where he went. That is the death that he's talking about. It is that eternal death that flows from everlasting to everlasting. It is that cessation of life from God Almighty. It is the ultimate consequence of sin. The Lord Jesus Christ had to sink into that because he had become sin and the only one that can bring you out of that is God Almighty. And he prayed and God heard him and delivered him in that he prayed. Amen. And so the battle rages. But what was not so obvious? The cross is obvious. The crucifixion is physical. And it can be seen with the natural eye. But in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 19, this is not so obvious and not so easily seen. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You could not see that with a natural eye. None of your five senses could understand that that was happening when Christ was on the cross. But Almighty God the Father was in God the Son, there at the tree, and he was straightening some things out. He was rectifying some wrongs. He was bringing man and God together. It was there at the cross, God bless your soul, that a holy God and a sinful man were united together. And it was God that did the uniting. It was the one that had been a that one had been sinned against who came down from above and there on the tree put forth an olive branch. He put forth a hand of mercy and redemption and grace and he reaches out from the cross to every hell-bound sinner on the face of this earth and says, Be ye now reconciled to God for he hath reconciled himself unto you. God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself and the apostle goes on to make a statement that boggles the mind that'll blow you away if you can understand the full ramifications of what it means. The Bible says, and there on that cross 2,000 years ago, when God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we, my friend, that we, my friend, glory to God, he doesn't stop by making him sin. He goes on to say that we, this low-down dog that I am, that we, that's you with all your filthy sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. Oh, boy. You can crawl and penance all you want to. You can cut the blood out of your soul. You can give your life to be burned. You can pay all you can give of money that's made on this earth. And you'll not buy one bit of the righteousness of God. The only way the righteousness of God will ever be applied to a human being is by God Almighty Himself through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself when He had stripped Him openly, when He had stripped away Satan's power. He stripped away His, his lying, deceptive mantle. He stripped it all away. And probably the angels were watching. The spirit world was fully aware. And when He opened Him up, for that's what it means, He opened Satan up so the spirit world could see what he really was made out of, then God made Christ to be sin. Oh boy. Who knew no sin? Did you get that? 
Look at the contrast between Satan being opened up and Christ being made sin. It is the transfer of the guilt. It is the transfer of the condemnation. It is the transfer of the reproach from Satan to Christ who now bears in his body everything of the wrath of God upon mankind. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Blessed be the Lamb of God forevermore. Amen. Praise His holy name for what He has done for me. He saved my unworthy soul. I bless Him to name praise Him. As long as breath is in this body, I will exalt His high and holy name. Amen. 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 He didn't say He made Him to be me. The Bible said He made Him to be everything I'd ever done. He made Him to be sin. Who knew no sin? Can any man convince him of sin? No. For the Son of Man is the sinless, perfect Lamb of God. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse 11. And <laughs> take hold of the mind of God. It's a hard thing for a human being to do. But let's look at the text here in Ephesians 3.11. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse 11, According to to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you get that? Before he ever made Michael and Gabriel and a cherubim and a seraphim, Christ Jesus the Lord had the eternal purpose of being the redeemer of mankind. Are you saying that Christ Jesus the Lord was before the world? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now you mean to tell me that you don't believe God created him? No, I don't believe that for a minute. God didn't create God. Jesus Christ is God. If some religious pervert has told you that there was a time when the Lord Jesus Christ came into being, he is the condemn he's condemned of God, he's a liar and a deceiver, he doesn't know him, he's an antichrist. The Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. Hallelujah. Amen. No beginning. And make no mistake about it, no end. Hallelujah. The eternal purpose which he purposed in him. And here's the last thing. When I look at the cross, I see this. I see a preview of what awaits the unbeliever. If the cross has such horror, and it does, it has such horror, and it does, it must be that the cross represents a horror that it sets in contradistinction to. Why was his suffering so great? It must be that there is suffering that is so great to follow. In other words, if the price was so great to be paid, then the condemnation itself must be great. Why would God give his only begotten son unless what follows is worth it? Why would one so precious and so beautiful and so wonderful as Christ have to give his life? It must be that the whatever that he's dying for must be a horrendous, horrible thing. You don't take gold and buy mud with it. If you buy, if you give gold, then you buy something of equal value. If you give the Son of God, if you're offering up the blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, then if you're offering up heaven's glory, then what you're offering him up for must bear some horrible, horror, horrible, horrible, horrid thing. What's that, preacher? Some of you will close your eyes in death unprepared. And when the death angel comes, no man has power over the spirit to retain it, the Bible said. The only one that ever walked this earth that could dismiss his spirit was the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Did he not? And gave up the ghost. That's another place in the Bible that tells you what death is. The Bible says in the book of James, as the, body, as the body without the spirit is dead, and the Lord Jesus Christ submitted his spirit to God the Father, that's death. That's physical death of a human being. But you don't have power to retain it. You can beg and you can cry and you can plead all you want to. And when your time's come, time comes for your spirit to leave your body, you're going to die. And some of you are in for a shock. You are in for a shock. You are in for a shock. Satan's greatest power is his ability to put you in la-la land. 
He can cause you to live in this make-believe world where you're, where, you're, where you're just so caught up with everyday life that you're living by your five senses. You see it, you hear it, you smell it, you touch it, you, you taste it. And if you can't see it, hear it, smell it, touch it, and taste it, it doesn't exist. But let me tell you something. There is a world that exists that is far greater than the five senses. And you are not the five senses. You're a spirit being. And the moment that your spirit leaves this body, you're going somewhere. Let me give you these things and I'll come to a close. Hell is a place of torture. The rich man died in Luke 16, lifted up his eyes in hell and said, I am tormented in these flames. The Lord Jesus Christ was tormented at the cross. Torment for torment. Was he not? There is desperation in hell. Let me go back and warn my five brethren. He said in Luke 16, the Lord Jesus cried at the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Desperation for desperation at the cross at Calvary. And there's a finality to the cross. They came and they said, come down from the cross, come down from the tree. If thou be the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed of God, come down, show us, we'll believe you. Why couldn't he come down, preacher? Because love held him to the cross. But it was a finality. It finished something. The cross finished something. And so is hell. It is a finality. Where is it, preacher? Tell me where hell is, preacher. Just tell me. Where is it? I can tell you where it is as certain as you're hearing me right now. Where, preacher? Where? It's at the end of of a Christ-rejecting life. Amen. Amen. That's where it is. The location of it is in the heart of the earth. There's both a physical and metaphorical end, place, location, time to hell. And then finally, the cross is a place of judgment made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why did he do that, preacher? Why did he make him sin for us that knew no sin? Because he could punish him then. He could pour his wrath. He could not pour his wrath upon the sinless, perfect Son of God. God doesn't operate that way. Holiness will not touch holiness. Righteousness cannot pour out wrath and condemnation on righteousness. God has to be just in everything that he does. So in order to punish his son who died, what we call, this is a big word, but it's a word that means something, a vicarious death, a vicarious substitutionary death. What's that mean, preacher? It means that he died in your place on the cross. He made him to be sin. Therefore, when he made him to be sin, he could pour out his judgment upon him. That's love. That's the Father loving you and making the Son pay for it. But it's judgment. Hell is a place of judgment. Hell at the end of a Christ-rejecting life is a place of judgment and condemnation. Some of you have never faced death. You've lived a sheltered life. You've never faced it. You never thought you were going to die. Some of you think now you're 15, 16, 17, 20 years old, 30 years old. You think, well, I got 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I may live up into my 90s. And so, you know, I'm just going to sail right along. Who needs God? I've got all this time before me. Some of you have faced death. Some of you have faced it. And I don't know that I've ever met a person on the face of this earth that's ever faced death that it didn't affect. I'm not talking about facing death when you see somebody's body laying in a casket. I'm talking about you thinking you're going to die. If that ever comes to you, it'll change your perspective on everything. And there's no way you'll know that unless you experience it. You can't get it from a book. It's experiential you got to do it. you got to go through it. 
you got to face it on your own. Those of you that have faced death and came out on the other side, it did something for you. If you're truly born again, it reassured you that when that moment comes, you'll be ready. You'll be ready. And it will come. But for those of you that weren't ready, you witnessed something that you don't like and you don't want to tell people about. It's terror. And nobody's around. You know, nobody to brag to. Nobody to be cool with. When you come down to that moment where your spirit is going to leave your body, I'm going to tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be you and God. That's all. That's all that's going to matter. You and God. Are you ready for that moment? Now, this is the worst thing about this world. What's that, preacher? The, the uncertainty of it. Uncertainty. Guy goes wild yesterday in Florida, kills seven people. This guy's running a train over here in, in, in Spain, flying 120 miles an hour down through there, hits the curve, train buckles, and what, how many people? 80, 90 people die in Spain. Uh, two or three Americans, one young woman from America. You know, plane goes down. Over here, this guy lands a plane in, out there in California. These three Chinese kids are coming in, teenagers. They're coming in from China to, to go to a, to a Christian meeting of some kind. When he comes down, he hits the tail first, and it messes his landing up. And so it, they skid to a halt, and the, flame, the plane busts into flames, and three kids die. One came in a couple of days ago, and he hit his nose wheel first and crashed, but I don't think anybody got killed. Day after day after day, Death is no respecter of age. No respecter. We got one of our own young people right now, a young teenage girl. She's over here in the emergency room at Children's Hospital. Her heart's racing away. I know what that's like. I've been there more than once in the ER. I can give you the, I can tell you exactly what they're doing. She's plugged up to IVs right now, and they're feeding her some medication, and that medication, it takes it a while, but that medication will slow her heart rate down. We pray. Because the longer it beats fast like that, the closer she comes to heart failure. And if that heart goes like that too long, her heart will go into heart failure once it goes into heart failure, then it progresses to what's called congestive heart failure. Once it gets into congestive heart failure, the output of the heart weakens, slows down, fluid builds up in the body, and then it's just a matter of time. If the heart rate's not stopped, not slowed down, she goes off into a coma. Now, I'm not saying this to scare these people. I'm trying to tell you what's going on, okay? Because I got to the point where congestive heart failure had set in. And I was so weak, I couldn't even stand up. That's what happens. And it happened to me in no more than just a few days. And it just came out of nowhere. And it can do it to you. It can do it to anybody. Are you ready? Are you ready? That's the main thing. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said now, Lord. Glorify thyself. Our Heavenly Father, the world's got a strong hold on people. The world's got a strong hold. They're tied up in this life. And they don't think about eternity. They don't think about where they're going. The Lord, they're near your hands now. I've preached. I've preached. I preach what you put on my heart. I ask you to glorify yourself this morning. I pray in Jesus' name now. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning. Let's sing. Page 329 in your all American. <coughs> <coughs> Won't you come? to come. Are you ready? Are you 
ready, my dear friend? Are you ready? Won't you come? Won't you come? verse, one more verse. Perky wants to be anointed with oil. He said he just got out of the hospital and he's got some problems. And uh, anybody like to come down the front here and pray with us? Let's pray for this brother. We're going to anoint him with oil and pray over him. <laughs> 